Hello there! Right now, I am 500 feet underground in Cerro Gordo's Union Mine. And this mineral you see behind me is Galena, which is a silver and lead ore. And this is a pure silver coin that they used to use in the mine here. And in this video, we're going to go from this raw ore all the way down to this pure coin using the same methods that they used back in the 1800s. And for a little bit of context, behind me is the former mining town of Cerro Gordo. And back in the 1800s, Cerro Gordo was the silver boom town. There were thousands of residents crawling all over these hills, and the main mineral that they were mining was galena, that thing that we just saw down in the mine. And I moved up here four years ago in March of 2020, trying to just bring life back to this place, you know, fully understand the history here. And if you're gonna understand the history of a mining town, it's very important to understand the history and the process of mining. And so here we are. And this video is going to have three main parts. Number one, we are going to go mining for silver. Number two, we are going to refine that silver. And number three, we are going to punch and stamp that silver into coins the same way they did back in the 1800s. And this whole coin obsession started with a historic find that happened right behind this house. A couple of years ago, we were right back here, trenching in a water line. And Trevor, this guy that used to work here, just yelled out, hey Brent, I found something. And what he found was a coin. Uh, so we found a cool old uh, Cerro Gordo store coin. Uh, it was good for 12 and a half cents. Is that the coolest thing you've got up here so far? Uh, definitely, yeah. And he, was, and he was busted out the valley detector pretty much right afterwards? Oh yeah. Company store. And this is a coin that on the front says, Cerro Gordo store, Keeler, California. And on the back says, good for 12 and a half cents in trade. And this is a huge discovery. Because in all of the literature across the 80 years that this was a mine, there's never any mention that they produced company currency, you know, company scrip. But this has a really big history. So scrip or this company money is basically credit that employers would extend to their workers. You know, this type of currency was very popular in mining camps, in logging towns, and you know, places like Kentucky, North Dakota, things like that where access to regular stores, housing, and all that is very difficult and it's very far away. So what these companies would do is they would basically set up the whole town. And in those places, the company owns, you know, the main operation, whether that's logging or mining, they own the housing, they own the general store, which I'm sitting in right now. And so because they own everything, they basically can just keep a tab for all the workers. And the script originally came up as almost like a payday advance. So imagine that you're getting paid, you know, uh, $4 a day or whatever. And you're like, hey, I need, you know, an extra 10 bucks this week for groceries. The company's like, sure, you know, take these tokens in lieu of that, we'll mark it down and you'll be good. But what happened was these workers would never catch up. You know, they'd never be able to repay their debt. And so the script would almost turn into the currency for the town. And that really gets into trouble because when you want to leave the town, you know, you want to exchange this token basically for US currency Nobody in town is gonna to do it for a one-to-one. -one. And so all of the money in town would just stay in town. And because of that, the company basically had a monopoly. What are you gonna do? Walk the 40 miles to their town to buy your groceries? And so no one really got rich, you know, except for the company. It was a way for the company to control everything, to keep things in town, to basically create a monopoly. And so script is really a form of debt bondage. You know, it's very predatory. It was outlawed in 1938 in the United States. You know, at the same time, cars were becoming more predominant, and so workers could travel a little further than the company town to get their supplies. But finding this coin was really important. You know, it was a piece of history. It shed a different light on the town than I think I had before. And it got me thinking. This is the Union Mine here at Cerro Gordo. And most, if not all, of the $500 million worth of minerals that were pulled out of these hills came right out of this mine shaft behind me. The miners back in the 1800s were working 12 hour shifts down there and they would get paid $4 a day below ground, $3 a day above ground. So to get into that mentality of the miner and get enough silver to make these coins, I did a little 12 hour shift myself down in the Union Mine. 
We're doing the night shift. I'm going to go up to the hoist. We're going down to the mine. We're gonna do a 12 hour shift, just like they used to back in the day. We're gonna see how much Galena we can get out, have a little fun, do a little exploring. When Jason and I assayed this stuff before, the ore was usually going from anywhere between $2,000 a ton, all the way up to $4,000 a ton. If the value is going between a dollar and $2 a pound, we should be able to tell about by the end of the night, how many dollars worth of ore I was able to get out. You know, let's see if I can get, well, hey, at least a hundred dollars worth, right? The 12 hour shift underground felt very long. You know, I started down the shaft right after 6 p.m. after an already pretty long day with the goal of getting as much Galena out as I could. This is the chute that we're gonna go down. I hate this bucket. So what we're doing right now is we're going in between the 400 level and the 550 level. So we made it down to the first landing. Now I have to go down this, which is an ore box. Let's get down this last chute. And then we are mining. So we're trying to go down right now just to shoot, but I gotta get this bucket down there with me. No! On a scale of one to 10, how predictable is that? I'm gonna say a 10. I knew it was gonna happen. It was being lazy anyways. We still got probably 11 hours to go. Oh boy. All right. All righty, look. Glitter City, that's what we're looking for. Folks, let's get this light on. It's not easy to get this rock to budge. I tried chiseling it using a rock drill, and then I just tried beating the rock until it broke off the wall. I mean, look at that. Really high quality stuff too. This is what we have so far. You can see maybe at the light. It is very glittery and very nice. Some really good stuff left in there. I want to take out this whole wall tonight. From there, look at that. Awesome pieces. So The bucket approach is not gonna work. I have to take smaller loads with my backpack instead of trying to take that bucket up. The bucket just too cumbersome, too narrow, too heavy. This is about to break. And when I finally get back to the cage, I was always surprised how little Galena I got from all the work. Final guesses. How much Galena do we have? First run. 49.2 pounds. Almost 50 pounds. And as the night went on, I tried a bunch of different things to just break up the monotony. You know, I read parts of my book to see how they sounded out loud. Pre-orders mean everything in the book world. And so if you guys are able to, if you could pre-order this, any of your books is sold. It's on Barnes & Noble, it's on Amazon, it's on Books A Million, it's on IndieBound, it's on BookSoup.org or whatever it is that shows all the indie retailers. Pretty much everywhere, there is an Audible version that will be coming out that is narrated by myself, but a pre-order just means the world to me. So please, if you have the moment, take a look, check it out. I play different card games. What excuse would I use to get out of jury duty? I live in an abandoned mining town. I'd use that excuse for a number of Zoom calls that I didn't want to be on. Sorry, reception's not very good. I live in a ghost. Soon we have internet all the way down to the 900 foot level of the mine. 
and I generally just tried to stay awake. And with each trip back over to the ladders, back down the ladders, back to the wall, hammering out more galena, back up the ladders, and back to the hoist, I was getting closer, you know, closer to completing this first step in the coin making process. All right, we got a pretty good haul. I'd say we got, oh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 pounds worth, bringing our total up to maybe about 75, maybe a little bit more. This thing is great, but look at some of these specimens. They're just stunning. Some of those beautiful pieces we have yet. I think that this hull is definitely prettier as far as aesthetically than the last one. So that's something. And by 6 a.m., I had just about as much as I was going to get, and I started my trip back up to the surface. I am stoked. I can't believe how excited I am to get out of the mine. Uh, and so I can only imagine what it was like for these guys back in the day, working this day in and day out, you know, 12 hours, 12 hours, 12 hours, 12 hours, hunched over, just miserable work. And I started my trip back up to the surface, very ready for a rest and very appreciative of all of the shifts that those miners used to do. So as you can see, since I mined all of our galena from down in the Union Mine, it has snowed. So I need to clear this. I need to probably build some of overhang so we can do the refining that we need to do. Because now it is time in the process to go from this, which is raw ore, down to pure silver. This is potentially the hardest part of the whole process. As you guys, galena is a mixture of silver, lead, sulfur, silica, and maybe some other stuff. And you need to get all of that out to get down to the pure silver. The process is called smelting. And smelting is something that they've been doing to Galena for 6,000 years. And the smelting process I'm going to be using is very similar to the process they used here at Cerro Gordo back in the 1800s. I know this because I found an article from 1870 that described exactly what they were doing here. Like literally right here, because this is the site of one of the smelters back in the day. They would take the Galena they would crush it up into about egg-sized pieces. They would add in some silver quartz into the mix, heat it up into basically a lead mat, and they let this pour out of the ground and cool. Then they would break that up, take five parts of the mat mix, add in one part galena, one part raw silver rock, one more part galena with iron oxide, and one part calcium carbonate. And the iron oxide and the calcium carbonate would act as a flux. And a flux and smelting is something that you introduce to promote fluidity, you know, some like liquid nature of it, and also pull out some of those impurities that you want to take out. You know, and after they had this whole mix, they would put it in the furnace with about 40 pounds of charcoal. And as the article states, the molten lead carries with it all the other precious minerals. And so basically the heavy things, you know, the lead, the silver, everything else, would kind of be tapped off into this one area, and eventually you'd be left with just the lead and silver at the bottom, and on the top you have a little crust, just about maybe this much, that would be called slag that you could break off, and this would hold all the impurities that you didn't want. And so all of this slag was broken off and separated, and what we were left with is just lead and silver. And the lead and silver was pulled out with a ladle and put into these 88 pound bars that they called pigs up here. And they were producing just many hundreds of these pigs every day. And they would ship them like that for a few reasons. You know, the first reason, if you were shipping 88 pound pure silver bars out of Cerro Gordo, it would get robbed over and over and over again. And the second reason is that the final part of the process, getting the silver out of the lead, is a very difficult process and one that they just didn't want to do up here. And so with that, let me show you exactly how to do all these different steps. So we got our galena out of the mine, crushed this up, and we're gonna add in what's called flux. The flux is gonna pull out everything that isn't lead and silver. In this case, we're using soda ash. We're gonna add some iron into the mix too. In this case, I'm just using some old nails. Throw that in, take it over to the furnace, and heat this up to about 
16 to 1800 degrees. All right, so as you can see, we got the Mortent Galena Plus Flux into the cone mold. All the heavy metals should be sinking to the bottom of this. It's so really like this cool for a long time. As you can see, it's still smoking. And then we're gonna flip it over. It's gonna be a cone. We're gonna break off the bottom, which should contain everything that isn't lead and silver. And then we're gonna go from there. Now, if we did this right, the top of it is gonna be the lead and silver. So that's gonna be hard. It's gonna be malleable. You know, kind of like imagine hitting lead. And we're gonna keep doing this process over and over again until we get all of the Galena down to these cones. Then we're gonna take it all the way down to silver. So this should contain anything that isn't lead and silver. And this malleable bit right here, that's the lead and silver. So that's what we're gonna put to the side and save to refine further later. Oh yeah, this is, this is nice. We got our slag pile, we're getting there. One, two, three. With the three initial pours, we had three lead and silver cones ready for further processing. All right, so we're a couple days in and we have our lead and silver pyramids. And today it's time to go from this down to pure silver. And we're gonna be doing that by doing something called the Parks process. And the Parks process is going to be a situation where we're going to reheat this up and then we are going to introduce zinc. And zinc is 3000 times more likely to bind with silver than it is for lead. So we're gonna drop in some zinc once it's molten. So it's going to bind to the silver pull it to the surface and we have a little film of zinc and silver on the surface again. At that point, I'm gonna scrape off the zinc and silver. We're gonna put that into what is known as a cupel. And once it's in the cupel, the zinc will oxidize and we'll be left with silver right at the bottom of this. All right, and now to add the zinc. All right, so I made a little mistake. Whenever you introduce stuff into that hot molten lava, it needs to be a little bit warmed up. And I dropped cold zinc nuggets into the molten stuff, and I didn't really like that that much. But we got our mixture now and there, so I'm gonna heat it back up. Then we're gonna start scraping it off, getting this zinc and silver, they gain out of silver. That was a uh, fun little burst. All right, so this was all the crust, and the stuff on these three was the crumbly stuff that I took off first that I think still has a lot of slag in it, and this stuff was the final stuff I took off that I think might have more silver. So at the end, we're going to see how big the bead is in each of them of silver. So we heat this up, and that's going to get us down to just pure silver. Then we combine them all together. So there's our six beads. One, two, three, four, five, wait, six. So once this cools off, I'll condense them all into one and we'll redo it so that all together one bead of silver. Cool. In between refining sessions, I've been building a workshop attached to the hoist house. We got posts going into the shop. We'll throw some concrete in those today, let those settle, you know, then put on the little overhang the next day. Then we should have a secured shop. As I was starting on the overhang, Nick Martinelli called me. And Nick's the guy that, once I got the silver made, he's gonna come with all the tools to make the coins like they did back in the day. So let's call Nick back, see if we can get a game plan together. Nick, I met last year at a conference in San Francisco, and he's just a general maker. He knows how to make pretty much everything. And he's on the floor of the idea. He said, hey, would you ever wanna make some coins related to Cerro Gordo? And I said, yes. And with that, we were off to the races. Plan is this, Nick is coming with a fly press. So imagine a giant thing press things down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna press some silver down, we're gonna roll it out, we're gonna punch it with the press to punch out circles, then we're gonna stamp it like they used to back in the day. And we're gonna try to recreate Cerro Gordo coin. We're gonna all make a few of them and stay tuned because at the end, there might be a way to get a couple of these things. The overhang now has a roof, tar paper, and sheet metal and is ready for more smelting, as well as a wall to keep the snow out. And as the storm is rolling in, the wall on the side is looking pretty good. This is gonna prevent snow from ripping into the shop. Already feels pretty nice in here. No wind around back here. I'd say for the day it's looking pretty dang good. Oh, 
what a difference a day can make. This open concept might need some rethinking, maybe some removable doors, because this was hopefully an area to continue working during snowstorms, and I thought maybe this would stop it, but whips in from different directions, and we still have half a bucket <laughs> of snow and slag that needs to get refined. So I'm gonna break that out, and we will continue smelting this, or we're gonna get down to lead and silver. As long as it's not windy out, I'm good to go. But Cerro Gordo and the snow. So I'm gonna take out some of that. I think I have too much actually in there. We're gonna reduce that down, get into a cone mold, get it down to silver and lead. All right, it looks like all of the metal recovered from the lower Cerro Gordo slag is ready to pour. I'm gonna pour it in one of the old molds that they used to use for the bars up here in Cerro Gordo. We're then gonna chop it back up and make it all the way down to silver. So we're kind of taking homage to the past right now and uh, it's gonna look pretty cool. We're gonna keep all of this down, be left with 10 beads of silver. We'll then combine those and finally get the count of exactly how much silver is left. We're getting closer. That shop that I spent all that time building is up at the hoist. And in between me and the hoist up there, there is a couple feet of snow in the ground all the way up there. So I don't think that Nick is gonna be able to get up there in his rental truck that has the fly press in the back of it, which means I have to get my smelting stuff and bring it down here. A little bit of on the fly changes, which is always something at Cerro Gordo, but we're going to probably move the shop down by the church that way we can smelt. Hopefully then we can figure out a way from, to get from there up to the shop eventually. But all that shop building for nothing. All right, so we've moved locations down to the church and all of the silver that I've been refining over the last few months is down there. Melted it up there. We're going to put it into this. And so that will create a long thing that'll get fed into the mill so we can make it a little thinner. But right now, all of the last two or three months of work is in there. So we'll measure it after it gets poured into here to exactly how much we ended up getting. All right, this is the moment of truce. Two months, 12 hours in the mine, six tanks of propane, and probably 40 or 50 hours comes down to this. How much silver? Did we make it in the end? Get your guesses in now. So we have, get the little scraps in there. 10.3. Let's go. So at today's prices, I think silver is about 23 bucks. This is about $230 of the silver. That probably cost about that in propane uh, plus the time to make. But, but this is pure Cerro Gordo silver. And so from here, this is going to get smashed out in the mill to a sheet. We're going to stamp it, press it, punch it, make it in some coins. So this. So all that previous stuff was building up to. All right, realize that uh, this is just regular ounces. So we're going to try to go to grams, which it's 290 grams right now. I know troy ounces are different. So really, if we're doing troy ounces, that's about 9.3 troy ounces of silver um just because that is a distinction we'll never forget often but 9.3 troy ounces it's a little less than we wanted but i was going with regular ounces so i think we're in there and after all of that refining now that we have some sweet sweet cerro gordo silver it is time to make some coins and i am going to make coins the same way they've been making coins since the 1500s and that is with a screw press. And screw presses have been around for much longer than the 1500s. You know, back in the Roman days and 2000 years ago, they were using screw presses for wine production, olive production, and stuff like that. But in the 1500s, some Italians realized, hey, we can use a similar device to stamp out and press these coins that we want to make. Before the screw press, if you're making coins, you're making them with one of these. 
a hammer, and some dies. And that's called hammer coinage. And you basically just go all day long, which obviously would be very slow, difficult, and not nearly as effective. Another way they would do them before that would be called casting. So essentially create a mold for your coins, heat up your liquid metal, pour that into the mold, and boom, you got your coins. But neither of these ways were nearly as good as a screw press. So the fly press was huge in coin making. You know, the London Mint started using it in the 1600s. And that's what we used pretty much all the way to the 1900s to make coins. You know, it's very likely that this coin that we found here, this one that says Cerro Gordo store on it, was made using a fly press somewhere in the area, which is so cool. But unfortunately, I do not have a fly press, nor do I know how to use them, but I'm in luck. Nick was able to track down a fly press that was actually from somewhere between 1908 and 1912 is what we determined. And that was perfect. You know, that's pretty much exactly when these coins were made up here at Cerro Gordo. But again, this fly press is very powerful, very convenient compared to hammering stuff, but very heavy. <laughs> and so that reason, we shipped the fly press up to Nick's shop in Sacramento. He's got a good work area outside where he could actually sandblast it do a little bit of restoration and get it ready to bring it down here to Cerro Gordo. Well, I think the moment is here. I think that Nick has arrived with the press. It's from 1908 to 1912, all the way from Chicago, now living at Cerro Gordo. And this is the thing that we're gonna use to press out the coins and stamp them. When Nick arrived, it was an exciting time. You know, after dealing with the snowstorm for so long, it was good to have his expertise equipment, and help here to try to make these coins. So the silver, you know, is melted in this, which is thanks to Pepe Tools. They're the ones that provided this as well as the mill. And so the silver will get poured into the ignit mold like this, as this one was. This one will transfer over here, which then this will get rolled through here and get elongated. Once we have the thickness we need, this comes over to this, put it through here. This is the die here. You can see this is the back. This is the 12 and a half cents to the front Cerro Gordo. Then press that down again, and then we will have a coin. We're gonna try to cut out this porosity here so that we get a nice clean uh, ingot. And then we can run that through the mill and then have a nice surface to cut the coin blinks. So making coins is hard. That is the first thing that struck me as we really started to get into a groove. It's another thing that I just carry around in my pocket every single day and I just completely take it for granted. So I felt very lucky that Nick showed up with a crew. This is the Pepe Tools rolling mill. And we're gonna roll out this ingot of Cerro Gordo silver. All we gotta do, feed it in this one. Just crank it a little tighter each time. Yep. They're not too tight. It's a pretty stout mill, but we just don't wanna push it. You know, yeah. A couple more and then we're gonna kneel again. See how it's curving down? Yeah, it's starting to get hard. So. All right, this silver. Now going in with the other silver, ready. The longest part of the entire coin making scheme is the annealing process. This is where you have to heat up the metal to change its crystalline structure to make it softer and able to be worked a little bit more. You know, first, when we were using the rolling mill to flatten out the silver, we would have to stop, reheat the silver into a glowing red, cool it down, start rolling again, and pretty much every few millimeters, we were having to again anneal it so it could be soft enough to be rolled. And then, before you can press the die into the coin to get your design, you have to anneal again. So it must have just been hours of heating. Our furnaces stayed on all day long as we had different strips of metal being rolled, annealed, stamped, annealed, pressed, annealed, and finally finished. Yeah. We're at the point now we're gonna be making some coin blanks. So we're gonna use this machine, not really a machine, it's a die press. We're gonna spooch this silver in here until we can see that it's gonna cover the whole area for the coin. Now 
There it is. <laughs> a blank. Now it becomes a coin. There we go. There are the uh, five. One, two, three, four, five blanks. You reuse this, but the next step is we're going to stamp these with what we need them to be. But we're getting there. We got coins. All right, now that we have the blanks, these are the dies. So this is the bottom. So we're 12 cents. This is the top. So we're store. So this can go on the bottom like so. This will go on the top like so. This will make a coin. So All right. One. There's one. I did more. Should be a 100 more. Pure Cerro Gordo Moin. So here they are. The first 10 coins, purely Cerro Gordo silver. And they are beautiful. Handmade on site. All right. Day one, coin making has come to an end. And big things, we got the fly press in place. We've got our silver lined up tomorrow. So these strips are gonna start getting flattened in there. So we can keep rocking and rolling. And overall, it's a pretty good day. It's been a day. <laughs> <laughs> So here is the recreation of the coin that Nick made. And now we will see the original coin. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's Not pretty... to toot my own arm yeah. here, but... They are pretty much identical. We'll flip them over, give it the full test. Woo! Pretty good for going off of just a picture. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. <laughs> I'm over here next to the new hotel. And if you look at the hillside, there's still some charred remains of the old hotel and the fire that took it. And there's some pipe and some wiring. And so what we're gonna do is actually snip a bunch of this copper wiring and melt that down into some coins as well. And so the wreckage of the old hotel will help fund the new one as well. So we're gonna snip a bunch of this as we can Give us some more material, and then get back to stamping the coins. Set. It's old copper. We get this out of here too. Make this down into coins. By day two, we were running a little low on the Cerro Gordo silver, so we supplemented some more into the blend. We had all found our role in the production line and really started cranking. As the day went on, the stack of coins grew, and every new batch, we were learning something. You know, we were making adjustments to the process and I feel really nailing the process, which is just something I couldn't have done alone. So I felt very grateful and, you know, it was fun just to have other guys there too. All right, back at it with day three. They were trying to finish off the 100 silver coins and we're also going to make some of the copper ones that we made out of the wire from the hotel. So, about to get locked and rolled. Right, this is our copper hall from the old hotel. So we're going to wait up, see what we got. 37.4 ounces. Let's waste more points. That's the hotel. Going in to our cruise. It comes up the new. All right, we got the copper here. This is from the hotel. So we're gonna punch this out now into some blanks so we can stamp it further, but we got it polished up. The stuff is looking pretty cool. And before long, we had our stack. 100 silver coins and 29 copper ones. So we have the final product, 100 beautiful silver Cerro Gordo coins. And listen, you guys have been watching this far. I wanna do something fun. I'm gonna give away one of the 100 to somebody watching. What I'm gonna do is put it inside this book, which is my new book, Ghost Town Living. I'm gonna put this in a Ziploc and I'm gonna go hide it off of Cerro Gordo property. It's not gonna be on this property, so don't come up here looking around. But I think that that's the appropriate thing to do. You know, you guys have watched this far. You know the whole process. You know how much goes into these things. These things are collector's items. This book is a book for those who want to kind of live a life of adventure. You know, they want to dare boldly. They just want to find their purpose and lean into life. So I feel like it's an appropriate book to put this coin into. So I'm going to put this in a Ziploc, get on my dirt bike, pay attention. I might be taking some alternate routes to get to where this is going to be. 
but this is gonna be fun. If you find this, please tag me on Instagram. I'm at Brent W Underwood on there. I'd love to see who ends up with it, but I feel like it's only appropriate for some person watching to get one of these for free. So watch this. And so there it will rest. I really hope one of you guys comes down here, grabs this book and coin. If you do, tag me on Instagram. I'll make a little post about whoever finds it. And if you're out there and you're saying, hey, I'm too far away, I'd still have a chance to get one of those coins. There are two more ways, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, but first, if you're out there, I really hope you take a moment to check out the book. You know, if you love the history of Cerro Gordo, the adventures that have been going on up here last few months, few years even, you know, that if you feel that call for adventure, that bold life, just this book is for you. It's available everywhere books are sold. It's called Ghost Town Living. And I've just poured my heart and soul into this thing. It's the best thing I've ever created, I think. And really hope you guys check that out. Um, and now back to the coins, the main event, 99 left. And 98 of those we're going to be selling as a fundraiser for the American Hotel. Each coin, as you guys saw, was made with a lot of heart, but each coin is going to come with a certificate. And each of these certificates are good for one night at the American Hotel. I cannot guarantee when this hotel will be done. I cannot guarantee when this certificate will be usable. But I will say, that's what each of these coins are going to be used for. You know, back in the day, these were good for trade. They're going to be good for trade once more for one night in the American Hotel. So if you're out there and you want to be amongst the first to ever stay in the American Hotel, Check out the link in the description below. It's gonna have all the information about how to get one of these 98 for yourself. And for the final one, the 100th, I'm just gonna give away with a classic giveaway. Below, there's gonna be another link. It's free to enter, and we're gonna give one more of those away to some lucky person. Because I think the big feeling of this whole video is just gratitude and thank you. You know, thank you to Nick for helping me do all this as buddies, but thank you to everybody watching this. You know, without you guys, there will be no channel, there will be no book, and I feel a great debt of gratitude to every single person watching this video. And so if you take nothing else away from this, take away a thank you so much for just giving me an amazing four years. Um, I'm excited for some of you guys to have these in your own home, and I'm excited for everybody else to come up and check out Cerro Gordo one day. You know, we're open every day, nine to five, no charge to check it out. But that's it, that's all. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. And I can't wait to see you guys next time.